He was Pelinor the White Strake because of his left hand, made of a killing light. He was Pelinor the Bloody, for he drank it in victory. He was Pelinor Insurgent because he gave the Crusades a face. He was Pelinor in Triumph as the words eventually became synonymous, and men at arms gave thanks to the eight when they saw his banner approaching. He was Pelinor the Blamer, for he was quick to admonish those allies of his that favoured tactics that ran counter to his sword theory. And he was Pelinor the Third, because some said he was a god geyser, who had incarnated twice before already, and because he was the third vision given to Alicia in her prayers of liberation. It was a time of great peril in the heartland of Sirid. To be human was to be condemned to brutal enslavement, deep within the Aelid citadels, known for their magnificence and timeless beauty. The Nedic peoples saw not splendor, only horror. The artistic innovations of the Aelid Elves remains unrivaled to the modern day, but as their hubris flourished, their capacity for mercy withered. In pursuit of brilliance, it was the men who suffered. The slaves toiled away every waking hour to build monuments of Aelid greatness, and when they were done, they were tortured for sport and pleasure. The blood of the slaves spattered the walls they themselves had built. Those needs who were not bent beyond breaking point by the labour, or torn to pieces of sinew and viscera by the torture, spent their sleepless nights praying for escape. But for the longest time these prayers would go unanswered, until a young woman with no name enslaved within the Aelid city of Sard bowed her head in prayer. She beckoned the Aedra to liberate the humans from the Daedra-worshipping Aelids. She spoke to the Handmaiden of Kain, who is Mara in the Nordic Pantheon, and the Handmaiden granted her divine visions. She saw Kain's son, the demigod Morahouse. He was a mighty and snorting, gore-horned, winged man-bull, who would be her lover, and he would help her rally other slaves to her rebellion. And then came a vision depicting the one who would lead her armies. He was shown to her as a diamond soaked red with the blood of elves. This diamond would transform into a man whose every edge and angle could cut down her Aelid jailers. He was arrayed in armour so perfectly crafted that it must have been from the future. And his name was Pelinel, the Star Made Knight. He walked into the jungles of Sirid already killing, Morahouse the man bull stamping at his side, froth bloody and bellowing from the excitement, because the Pelinor was come. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. The subject of today's video is potentially my favourite in the entire Elder Scrolls universe. This character is steeped in ancient folklore, passed down by countless generations, embellished by scores of sweet-talking storytellers and starry-eyed singers. His story hails from the Merefic and early First Eras, and it's near impossible to separate the fact from the myth. But that's what makes his story so engrossing. Was he just a man devoted to saving the races of men from the oppression of the Elves? Was he an avatar of the Aedra, sent to Tamriel by divine light to carry out the will of the gods? Or is he something else entirely, like a time-travelling cyborg, returning to the past to fix the future? Whatever he is, we'll know all there is to know about him by the end of this video. For now we have a story and a name, Pelinor Whitestrake. This nameless woman who had convened with the Aedra was successful in gathering rebels for her cause. With numbers at her back and two divine heroes promised to arrive, there would be no better time than now to strike at their elven jailers. And her vision soon came to fruition, as Pelinor and Morahouse arrived at the nameless woman's camp of rebels. Whitestrake held his sword and mace, both encrusted with the smashed viscera of elven faces, feathers and magic beads, which were the markings of the Aeladoon, stuck to the redness that hung from his weapons. Pelinor lifted his weapons before the congregation of slaves and said, These were their eastern chieftains, no longer full of their talking. Such an intimidating sight would have been catharsis to the needs. Many of them would have been born in captivity, and those who weren't born in the citadels would have watched their homes burn when the Aelids and their Daedra armies came to take their lands and enslave their families. To many of the slaves, this would have been their first sight of elven blood, a welcome change to the blood of human slaves that was so liberally spilled by their oppressors. It was around this time when she had acquired a sizable following that the nameless woman became their leader, and their slave queen. Eventually, later in this story, she would be given a name. They would call her Alesh, which means High Highness, for they were awestruck by this woman who could talk to gods and bring hope to the hopeless masses of men. The name Alicia was a corruption of this title that evolved over time. 
The legends hold that Alicia's visions were given to her at the ancient citadel of Sancrator, and when the rebellion claimed this fortified city, Alicia established her holy city there. From here, Saint Alicia and her slaves began their open revolt against the slave masters. Pelinal Whitestrake's first elf blood-soaked impression upon the slave rebels was striking, and they soon saw that he was exactly what the goddess Kine had promised. In those early days, Pelinor was the enemy of all elf kind. While his conflicts with the Aelid Elves would be his legacy, it is documented in the book Before the Ages of Man that he wandered Tamriel long before he was sent to aid Saint Alicia in the Heartland. This book was written by the ultimate author Icantair of Shimmerine, and it may well have been simply propaganda for the Aldmeri Dominion, because he was in fact the leader of indoctrination for the First Dominion. Despite this possibility, his work is generally accepted to be credible, and this particular book presents the major events of the Dawn and Morefic Eras with some measure of impartiality. The book says, During the late Morefic Era, the legendary immortal hero, warrior, sorcerer and king, variously known as Pelinor Whitestrake, Harold Harry Breeks, Izmir, Hans the Fox, etc., wandered Tamriel, gathering armies, conquering lands, ruling, then abandoning his kingdoms to wander again. This quote tells us two things. Firstly, it is suggested that Pelinor had multiple aliases, and each of these, Harold Harrybreeks, Izmir, and Hans the Fox, are believed to be Shezarines. The Shezarines were a group of famed heroes and avatars that popped up throughout Tamrielic history, each bearing a connection to Lorcan, aka Shazar, the missing god. Whether the Shezarine is a manifestation of Shazar himself, or simply a champion of Shazar, is uncertain, but it is certain that these heroes possess supernatural abilities, many of which will be displayed by Pelinor in this tale. This is where the other explanation for Pelinor's title, Pelinor III, comes in. Some say this name comes from him being Alicia's third vision from the Aedra, while the other accepted explanation is that he was the third incarnation of the Shezarine. The quote also tells us that Pelinor Whitestrake was the bane of all elves, not just the Heartland Aelids. During the late Morefic early First Eras, Tamriel was almost entirely ruled by the various races of Myrrh. The Chimer and Dwemer occupied Resdane, the Snow Elves were still present in the north, the Dureni Hegemony dominated the Iliac Bay, the Aelids held central Tamriel, and the Wood Elves dwelled in the jungles of Valenwood. So for Pelinor to be wandering Tamriel, conquering lands, ruling and abandoning kingdoms, he would have almost certainly been taking these lands from elves. It's entirely possible that he warred with all the elven races of Tamriel, and it seems he actively sought out elves to kill in battle. He was so zealous in his myrrh massacring pursuits that it is said that he wiped out a huge chunk of the Khajiit population in elsewhere, mistaking them for a species of elf. This comes from the Pocket Guide to the Empire, 1st edition, which says, Indeed, Pelinor Whitestrake, Nibane Warlord of the Elven Pogrom, mistook the Khajiit for another strain of Aldmeri, and killed many of their number before realising his error. Such sources confirm most suspicions that Pelinor's persecution of the Elves was well organised and executed, even before a worthy cause like Elysia's came along. The Eight Divines may well have picked their side for the war to come, but the Aelids were by no means cocky. The Aelids had abused slave labour to build their mighty empire, but to underestimate them was foolish. They were undoubtedly one of the greatest civilizations ever to grace the continent of Tamriel, and they wouldn't roll over and take this insurrection lightly. The Aelids were not used to insubordination, and such disrespect of their authority provoked retaliation. The Sorcerer Kings of the Heartland planned to utterly demolish the rebellion, leaving no survivors. To show any mercy is to leave potential for a second rebellion to rise from the debris. At Sancrator, Pelinor called out the Aelid King named Haramir of Copper and Tea, and challenged him to a duel. Pelinor ate his neck veins while screaming praise to Riemann, a name that no one knew yet. While many of the onlookers may have been distracted by the gruesome display, those perceptive enough to hear his exclamation must have wondered who Riemann was, and rightly so. This is one of the pieces of evidence used when proposing the idea that Pelinor was a supernatural entity, and perhaps even a time traveller. This was around the 242nd year of the First Era, over 2,400 years before Riemann Cyrodiil was born. He proceeded to duel many other Aelid tyrants. The next was Gordhor, the Shaper, whose head was smashed upon the goat-faced altar of Ninandava. Pelinor then uttered 
uttered a small plague spell to ensure that the evil Shaper could not use the Aelid Welkin magic to reform. Later that very season, Pelennor tracked down the notorious Fire King. The Fire King Hadhul had likely earned his name from his particularly cruel treatment of Nedic slaves. In his memoirs, Morahouse the Manball mentions Hadhul. He says that the slaves who were not busy with labour were sometimes given to the hedonistic art torturers. These were the Wailing Wheels of Vindazel, and the Gut Gardens of Cersen, and the Flesh Sculpturers. But these weren't even the worst of the exhibitions, for there were the realms of the Fire King Hadhul, where the begetting of drugs drawn from the admixture of Daedrons into living hosts let one inhale new visions of torment, and children were set aflame for nighttime tiger sport. This monstrous despot poisoned his subjects, and showed no remorse even for children. But when Pelennor the Bloody ascended the granite steps of Siatar, Hadhul knew the hour of his reckoning had come. Pelennor slew the Fire King on those very steps, and Hadhul's spear finally experienced its first refute. Word of Pelennor the White Strake's deeds would have travelled fast, and many of the sadistic kings were surely embracing the unfamiliar feeling of humility. Their odds of escaping justice were shrinking by the day, and they were surely praying overtime to their Daedra lords now. For a time, no alien weapon could pierce Pelennor's armour, and this was because it was not crafted by mortals. Pelennor's duels against the Sorcerer Kings would be sung about for centuries, but he was not always the embodiment of chivalry, as his rages were infamous. His first madness struck when Huna, a soldier Pelennor had raised from grain slave to hoplite, and loved well, was struck down by an Aelid arrow. Pelennor wrought devastation from Narlame to Celadil, and erased those lands from the maps of elves and men. His destructive ire resonated all the way to the heavens, and Alicia was forced to make sacrifices to the Aedra to keep them from leaving the world in disgust. With greater Cyrodiil faltering from the deeds of Pelennor and the Elysians, it was time for the rebels to turn their attention to the White Gold Tower, the pinnacle of the Aelid Empire, their greatest monument. The Aelids had prepared for the inevitable battle to come. They made a pact with the Daedric Prince Meridia, the Lady of Infinite Energies. This alliance granted them her legions of Aurora Knights, made from pure light. The golden-hued Sorcerer King, Umaril the Unfeathered, became their champion, for he was half-elf, half-divine. The alliance granted him immortality, and the promise of rebirth in the coloured runes should he fall in battle. On top of this, the Aelids had discovered a way to damage Pelennor's divine armour using Valiants. The Sorcerer Kings were heavy with Valiants, and Umaril wrought the axes and arrows of the soldiers with long Valiants. It's hard to give an exact definition of Valiants, but it essentially means starlight, the same energy that the Aelids store in their Vala stones. For the first time since his coming, it was Pelennor who was called out to battle by another, for Umaril had the blood of the Atada and would never know death. Pelennor soon drove the sorcerer armies past the Nibbon, claiming all the eastern lands for the rebellion, and Kain had to send her reign to wash the blood from the villages and forts that no longer flew Aelid banners. Pelennor broke down the doors of the Aelid prison of Vartak, freeing the slaves while the slave queen flew on her winged bull lover overhead. This was the moment she was called Alesh for the first time, which would eventually lead to the Nedic bastardization of the title Alicia. Pelennor then led the pogrom against the Northern Aelids, returning lands to the Northerners of Falkreath. With the Nords among their ranks, Pelennor led the armies of men into the heart of the Hinterland West, driving the Aelids inwards to the Tower of White Gold. Aware of the human armies descending upon them from the Northwest, Umaril sent his Thundernarks to thin their ranks. Pelennor crushed them under the might of his mace. However, Morahouse, Breath of Kine, had fallen, wounded by a volley of bird beaks. Pelennor delivered his injured companion to the clever man healer to hasten his recovery. But without their man bull demigod, Alicia's armies and the legions of Nords shook with fear at the sight of the White Gold Tower. Morale had taken a hammer blow, so much so that even the Slave Queen, emboldened by her triumphant rebellion, decided upon a delay. Pelennor was furious and entered one of his famed bouts of madness. He spat curses at Umaril and at the cowards he saw before him, and then he made for the tower alone, driven by impulse and an ever-burning desire to spill elven blood. 
Pelennor marched on the citadel, and in this brief calm before the storm of swords, we can touch on the nature of Pelennor's madness. Even as early as Alicia's visions from Mara, it was clear that Pelennor was not a mortal warrior. In her vision, Pelennor came to her as a diamond soaked red with the blood of elves, and it is said that beneath his star armor lies a chest that gaped open to show no heart, only the blood red diamond, which sang like a mindless dragon. His actions weren't predictable the way immortals are. One moment he would be speaking to his gathered men, the next he would bellow a laugh, run into the reins of Kine and slaughter any elf in the area. Only Alicia could intervene, as she would pray to the gods for aid, and they would reach down as one mind to soothe the White Strake until he no longer had the will to kill the earth in whole. When asked by a comrade what such an affliction felt like, Pelennor responded, like when the dream no longer needs its dreamer. Even Pelennor the White Strake, the Star Made Knight, could be caught in the throes of an existential crisis. Umaril watched from afar as his allies fell to Pelennor's blade. Dead Aurorans littered the battlefield like chips of gold on the riverbank. Only then did Umaril deign to appear before the Champion of Men. Pelennor was surrounded by the remaining Aelid Sorcerer Kings, who were all weighed down by potent Valiants. The White Strake cracked the floor with his mace, sending them back. Bring me Umaril that called me out, Pelennor said. Aelid and Auroran soldiers continued to strike at his armor, piercing and denting it in numerous places. This pleased Umaril, who was fresh and untested. He appeared shrouded in Meridia's incandescence. The unfeathered champion announced himself by speaking outwardly of his father and his kin. All the while, Pelennor sucked in pained breaths, which delighted the gold-clad Umaril. Much of Pelennor's song was lost to time, including any first-hand accounts of the battle itself, but the aftermath is written in great detail. Umaril was laid low, the angel face of his helm dented into an ugliness which made Pelennor laugh, and his unfeathered wings had broken off with sword strokes delivered while Pelennor stood above him, insulting his ancestry and anyone else that took ship from old Elnafe, the elven homeland. This angered the other elvish kings and drove them to a madness of their own, and they fell on him with their weapons, cutting the Pelennor into eight pieces. The rejuvenated Morahouse brought Alicia's legion down on the city the next morning, and the tower shook from the tremors caused by the bashing of his horns and the stamping of his hoofs. The men searched for Aelids to kill, but Pelennor left few, only those kings and demons who had fled the previous day's battle. Morahouse wandered the battlefield in the aftermath, and when the White Gold Tower was taken, he found the severed head of Pelennor among the dead in the throne room. The Aelid kings had left it there to prove their deeds, and when Morahouse found the head, the two conversed. In this intimate moment between immortals, not even Alicia intervened. Morahouse wrote of the encounter in his memoirs. Pelennor's head said, our enemies have undone me and spread my body into hiding. In mockery of divine purpose, the Aelids cut me into apes, for they are obsessed with this number. And Morahouse, confused, said in response, Your crusades went beyond her counsel, White Strake, but I am a bull and therefore reckless in my wit. I think I would go and gore our prisoners if you had left any alive. You are blood made glorious, uncle, and will come again as fox, animal, or light. Cyrid is still ours. And this exchange is another piece of evidence suggesting Pelennor Whitestrake's divine providence. The son of Kine, the demigod Morahouse, calls Pelennor uncle. With the White Gold Tower captured and the Aelid Empire beaten, Alicia declared herself the first empress of the new Cyrodiilic Empire. The people needed a new religion that was familiar to the people of Cyrodiil, used to the elven influence, but also acceptable to the Nords, who were staunchly opposed to elven deities. So one of her first acts as empress was the establishment of the new religion of the new imperials. She combined aspects of the Aldmeria Nordic pantheons, and the religion of the Eight Divines was born. Upon Alicia's deathbed, she was visited by Akatosh, the chief god of the divines. She made a covenant with the dragon god, who blessed her with the blood of dragons. So long as she and her heirs remained true to the dragon blood, Akatosh would seal tight the gates of oblivion. To maintain the covenant, Akatosh gave the Imperials the dragon fires, which must remain lit eternally. And he bestowed upon her the amulet of kings, and in death her soul was bound to the amulet. But if the Empire should slacken in its dedication to the Divines, or if the blood of Alicia's heirs should fail, then the barriers guarding Tamriel from the Daedric realms would fall. Strangely, the records suggest that Pelennor Whitestrake was present at Alicia's bedside, despite this taking place over 20 years after his death by dismemberment. His final words to Alicia are documented, though fragmented, 
so it's hard to be completely sure what was said. He mentions his other half, which while vague, could be used as evidence for him being a Shezarim, or the mortal manifestation of Shazar. There is a theory called the Lunar Lorcan, suggesting that the missing god was split in two and his corpse can be seen in the night sky as the moon's Masser and Secunda. Pelinor also alludes to being present in the Dawn Era before the convention. It was at this convention that the elven deities Auriel and Trinamac tore out Shazar's heart and shot it across Tamriel. Finally, Pelinor says, Let us now take you up. We will show our true faces. And with this, Pelinor was tasked with escorting Elysia's soul to the afterlife. Pelena Whitestrake's legacy lived on long after the blood of elves had washed away. Without him, Alesh may never have succeeded in her rebellion. Morahouse was a mighty warrior, born from Kine's own breath. But to slay Umaril the Unfeathered, garbed in Meridia's brightness, that took another kind of light, the killing light of the Whitestrake's left hand. Even in the songs, pondering the true nature of Pelinor is avoided. His ghost reappeared to the champion of Cyrodiil, who continued Pelinor's legacy by defeating Umaril in his second coming. But I think we can safely talk about Pelinor's true identity now, without being killed by a ghost in a bout of madness. Even when embellished by a thousand bards, Pelinor's story could not be about a mortal. No man could have such a significant impact on the world. Have you ever heard of a mortal hero born without a heart? A mortal who could converse with his friends as a severed head, with his other body parts strewn around the battlefield. And resurrection can only be truly achieved by the divine, that or by some profane necromancer. But what about the time Pelinor cried out Riemann's name after slaughtering a foe, or when he speaks of the Dawn Era like it was yesterday? Well, this takes us out of the established canon, but some theories, most of which are supported by the infamous Michael Kirkbride, would assure us that Pelinor Whitestrake is a time-travelling cyborg, sent back in time to fix the future. But there you have it guys, the full story of Pelinor the Whitestrake, the face of the Crusaders, the blood-soaked diamond. I hope you enjoyed learning about one of my favourite characters in the Elder Scrolls universe. It would be amazing to see the early days of the first era in an Elder Scrolls game, to see just how much is real and how much is dramatised and romanticised. But then again, the way Pelinor's story feels like the story of a mythological hero is part of the charm, so maybe it should remain a mystery. Thanks so much for watching guys, I've been Drew, and I'll see you in the next one.